to the li least a little bit. And what I'd like to do is, um, you know, make this as interactive as possible and ho hopefully not to to show you too many boring slides. But, but let me start out by uh, introducing just a little bit of the center, the new center for smart lighting that we have has just been funded by the National Fi uh, Science Foundation at at Brinsalier. And, and most of you, many of you probably know that um, lighting is certainly going through a major transformation at this point from conventional light sources to sol solid state lighting. And some of the fundamental research is really going on here, right, at, right here at uh, UCSB. And when you have a wonderful researcher like doc Dr. Nakamura, and we have several other wonderful researchers here that I'm sure many of you are perhaps students. And I know we have a, a, a former student from Rensselaer who's part of that new group as a PhD student. But really what's going on is a fundamental shift in the way in which lighting will be, will be uh, done in, in, in the next, next generation or so, in the next, next few years, from conventional light sources through solid state lighting with controllability. And what we're trying to focus on at, at RPI is really looking at uh, smart lighting systems. So we're trying to take uh, all of those great innovations that are going on in the materials level and at the device level and to the systems level so that we can actually help to create the smart rooms and the smart buildings of the future to try to really get this stuff out and, and you know, for, of course, the purposes of improving human health for the purposes of really being able to create and, and use adaptive lighting both in home and office settings, as well as uh, using light for communications. And again, with one of the key ideas behind this is to get greater energy efficiency and really improve uh, our, the well-being of, of our, our planet and, and, and human beings. So at the Smart Lighting Center, um, we are, uh, you know, looking at the controllability of, 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 of LED devices and, and solid-state lighting devices, and again, trying to apply them to important problems, uh, you know, in, in, in lighting, in display technology, in human health, and in communications and imaging. And I'm not the technical person, but I can at least give you a little bit of what the flavor of what we're, what we're, what we're doing at the Smart Lighting ERC and a little, a little bit of a vision, but what I'm going to focus on is the social science part of the ERC work that we're engaged in and looking at what uh, we're, uh, some, a study that we recently did for the Department of Energy in which we were trying to track global patenting and trying to understand what companies and countries are doing in this LED space. And I'm going to give you a little bit of a, a flavor for that kind of work. And then the other thing I'm going to try to do is give you a flavor for um, some of the work that we've been trying to do in tracking uh, emerging industries and uh, comparing in particular what has happened in historically in some emerging industries to try to get some insights into how we might uh, do a better job, uh, particularly in uh, U.S. companies and, and companies um, the, to take better advantage of the fundamental research and design at work that's being done in, in great universities like this one and uh, take that into jobs and uh, the, the jobs of the future for, for our, our citizens. So uh, again, um, we're working on uh, some of the fundamental technologies, integrative devices, but with the idea and being driven by these application spaces. So in uh, bioimaging and uh, biosensing and communications and lighting for health and adaptive lighting, which are really the smart lighting in the smart buildings. And I won't talk too much about that until we get a little bit further into the, the future. And one of the things that engineering research centers do, and probably many of you who are students may not be familiar with NSF's programs uh, in engineering research centers, but it, uh, NSF has been uh, carrying out a program uh, for, with engineering research centers for about 10 or 15 years at this point. And there have been about 40 or more engineering research centers focusing on different technology areas. In this third generation engineering research center, NSF is particularly interested in being sure that research gets out into companies and that companies actually commercialize those research, that research. And another aspect of, of, of this is really the fundamental education of, of students so that they're good technical, very good technically, but they also have 
some sense of the business issues and the commercialization is issues. So that's one of, the, one of the other activities of the center. But part of being able to show what industry and help industry figure out what to do here is that um, there is a system of test beds that most of these NSF programs actually have in place. So that in, in addition to developing the fundamental technologies, they're actually uh, realized in, in a sense in the lab in a series of test beds that show and demonstrate how these things can, can be done. So we will have test beds using our bioimaging and biosensing uh, materials. We have already some uh, lighting, light communications test beds. Um, we have a lot of work being done in light for health and tracking uh, light, uh, LED lighting for uh, helping uh, with circadian rhythms and in particular in health contexts where uh, older people have trouble sleeping or Alzheimer's patients need need, need help uh, in training their circadian systems with, with LED lighting. And then um, most importantly, uh, adaptive lighting and displays uh, and, and adaptive lighting controls for smart rooms. And I'll leave that kind of discussion a little bit to, to the end. But what I'm going to talk about a little bit is, since I'm the social sci one of the social sciences on this, uh, scientists on this project, and we have another, my other colleague is um, Kenneth Simons, who is in economics, we're talking, we really are trying to understand how do we create, um, how do we understand what companies are doing, what research institutes are doing, and how is that going to translate into the uh, commercial success successful products as well as the jobs of the future. So that's kind of what, what our focus is. And the way we're actually doing that is we're looking at global patenting. We're looking at what's really being uh, patenting as a kind of measure of what kind of activities and work is being done around the world. And most of the time, at least in the United States, many people only focus on, many social scientists only focus on looking at U.S. patents and try to understand, just used based on U.S. patents, what, what's going on in the rest of the world. And unfortunately, by just looking at U.S. patents, you kind of overestimate how much work is being done in the United States versus everywhere else in the world. Because there's a tendency of uh, companies to patent first in their own nation, and then sometimes they'll go out and patent in another nation. But a lot of the fundamental work, they patent first in their own nation. So if you only look at the patents coming out of one country, you tend to overestimate what, what work is really being done. So we actually did a study for the Na for, that was also funded uh, by the Department of Energy to try to understand LED patenting in a global setting by looking at patent authorities around the world and trying to find out what was going on there. Another piece of the research that we're doing is trying to understand, well, here we've got the intellectual property and the um, the fundamental technologies that are being developed, but how do companies actually translate that into real products? And which companies are very good at getting those product, getting those technologies out and, and manufacturing products and manufacturing products that people really want to buy? So that's another piece of the whole commercialization thing. And, and the problem is that if you only look at the intellectual property or the patents that people do or the work that people do in an academic setting, you really aren't going to get the whole picture about how good or what are the issues or problems that actually companies have in getting those, getting those, translating that fundamental research into real products. So we're trying to also look at what, what companies do in that regard. And then the third piece of this is to look at what the role of public policy and how public policy can help or hinder uh, uh, in, in the whole development of, 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 a, of a regional, or, or regional economies and, and, and industries. And so that turns out to be kind of an important uh, issue in some of the fundamental emerging technologies where we have many, many countries and many companies striving to compete with each other for the location of manufacturing, for example, or for the location of research and development. And the idea here is that most people, and if you look at this phrase up here, the U.S. is counting on green and clean technology investments to create the jobs and stem global warming. That statement could be made in any country in the world. The Japanese government would say the same thing. We're looking to the future of green and clean technologies. The Chinese are saying exactly the same. The Taiwanese are saying the same. Everybody has the same thing in mind. And the question is, 
you know, what are we all doing about it so that we are really in a position to both generate the kinds of new technologies, commercialize those technologies really effectively, and truly create the future, future jobs that people are going to need in their own economies. So that's kind of the big picture of what we're trying to look at. Now, the question is, how do you study all those things? And it's not, not that easy to study those things. It's easy to talk about them in general, but how do you actually study them? So I'm just going to show you some examples of how we've taken, what approaches we've tried to take to study different pieces of this. And I don't want to bore you to death with some of the, the detailed findings from our DOE study, but I'm going to show you a few of them just to give you a feel for, for what we've done on that side. And then I'm going to give you a feel for a little bit of the work that we've done on tracking uh, a, a evolution of, a, of, of an, emerge, an industry that emerged a few years ago to see how various comp companies, d what various companies did over time and what was the result of that. And then we'll talk a little bit about the policy issues at the end because it's not very easy to figure out who's making what investments uh, from a governmental point of view. Tracking these kinds of things and understanding what kinds of investments are being made is, is really difficult. So. There's a lot of data problems, a lot of problems in trying to understand what is the data that will allow us to sort of measure these things and get a real feel for what's going on. So we'll talk about those a little bit too. And feel free to just jump in and inter interrupt me or, you know, I, mean, I won't feel it's an interruption. Just say, <laughs> jump in and, and we'll have a discussion rather than too much of a lecture here, I hope. So most of you know that, you know, photonics is really at the center of uh, of a revolution in many, many different uh, product categories and technologies. And all of us have our cell phones and our, our mobile devices and just all kinds of things where photonics is really at the center of many, many product categories. So, so the challenge is to, um, you know, to how, do you, how do you study uh, the commercialization? How do you study all those kinds of product categories that are really being affected by photonics at this point? It's, it's, not a, it's, it's, a, it's a rather big challenge. But um, these categories have really emerged, these applications in these categories have really emerged over some period of time. And there's becoming um, a, a, um, a convergence of capabilities that a lot of companies who were successful, say, for example, in the consumer electronics industry, are now moving into industries where they never really operated before. So for example, Toshiba is now making light bulbs and they were really, uh, you know, fabulous in terms of the consumer electronics products. So we've got this really churning up of, 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 of industries that used to be sort of separate <coughs> sectors and a lot of these product categories are really converging in some kind of way that is really changing the landscape the, the landscape, the commercial landscape for the companies that have been operated in, the, in, in these areas and creating a, a real challenge. So um, the study that we actually I want to report on a little bit today is this study of this analysis that we did, as I said, that was partly sponsored by the Department of Energy in which we looked at LED and solid state patenting um, that went beyond just looking at patenting in the United States. And the idea here was to probe and to understand international uh, R&D and, and to find a more global measure to really get a better feel for that. Um, so instead of just using patent counts that, de that, that depended on one nation's uh, data, we actually wanted to uh, eliminate this home company country bias by looking at patents globally. Um, so we looked at multinational patents and application data and again, this is an opportunity to sort of probe what's going on in various corporations and what's going on in, in you know, collectively sort of in, in nations. And I actually have a co-researcher here who is in nanotechnology who was a, who, who, who's, who's been working on regional development and trying to understand which nations, you know, are focusing on various areas of, of, of nanotechnology. We're trying to understand this more in the context of, of LEDs and solid state lighting. So. Um, so we did that to do this. There is a data set that makes it possible to do this, and this is a data set uh, that the European Patent Office actually collects worldwide patent statistics from all of these different pa application authorities around the world. So what we did was we worked out a, uh, a, a technique, which we'll talk about a little bit later, to try to figure out, you know, how do we, how, you know, uh, how do we, how do we 
get our hands around what are really solid state lighting patents and what are, what are LED patents. And what we managed to do is come up with about 185,000 or so related applications in 68 different nations. They were filed between very early on, 1930s, to over to about 2008. And uh, the last date that for which we have granted patents was, uh, was March 2009. Um, this is about 60,000 um, granted patents. And um, uh, I don't know if mo any of you know what a utility model is, but it's a, uh, a slightly less um, or, or somewhat less uh, 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 grant uh, that's smaller than, 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 a, than, a, than an actual patent uh, for, uh, uh, for some techniques for, for using that. So utility models was also part of our study. Very often uh, in uh, communist cu countries before the um, Eastern Europe and, and the Soviet Union, um, you know, opened their economies. They were often, very often, filed utility models because they didn't really believe in the private poverty kind of idea. So that was the way they went. So the way we actually studied this is we tried to do a sort of recursive search to identify these LED-related patents, partly be, by using, a, you know, sort of two techniques. One is these title keywords. And the other one is international patent codes. Um, now, now it's just to be a little bit more detailed about this, um, most countries, uh, many countries do not f have abstracts available for their patents. So it's a little bit difficult to do when you think about doing a keyword search. If you're only searching for a title, keywords in a title, you know that that's very difficult because you're only going to show uh, up a few of the th of the of the potentially relevant patents in in the area that you're looking at. So many of you, some of you, how many people have here have actually filed any patents? I know you have, and you have. When you think about the titles that you use for patents, very often you try to choose a very generic title. You don't choose a title that has a very specific uh, keyword in it. Um, Dr. Nakamura, could I ask you, your, ti your titles in your patents, do you try to choose a very general term or do you use? Very broad. So, yeah. So, so the, patents, the patents have a very broad title that make it seem like it could cover anything. <laughs> so that's a challenge for somebody who's trying to search the data and trying to figure out, well, how do I find out what is really an LED patent? Let me ask you, in your patent titles, do you have the word LED in your titles very often or not so much? No, usually just a uh, uh, device. Uh, yes, <laughs> yes, <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So he's illustrating the, the challenge here. So if I'm trying to figure out what are all those patents related to LEDs, and in the title, I don't have anything that says LED or solid state lighting or anything else, I need to know the specific material name or I need to know one of these keywords, or I need to know one of these IPC codes that classify his patent into that space. How about you, Dan? When you do your patent certain things, were there the general things you eliminate? Well, so, the most important thing is to make sure that the claims are general. Yes, well, yes. The title should reflect that. Yeah, yeah, that. yeah, yeah. So, so it's really tricky. So you're trying to figure out, well, who is patenting in this space? Yet the, the way to, to, to do it is you have to either search the abstracts or you have to search the title. And for some countries, they don't have the, the abstracts are not available. So it's, it's tricky to try to figure out what falls in this domain that we're trying to talk about. That's the first, first tricky thing. So we tried to figure that out. Um, and then we also, Sorry, how yes. Do you, how do you avoid um, over counting? You know, so if I file a PCT application and it's a national base, I go into 12 countries. Are you going to count all 12 countries? What we did was we actually counted multi nation patents, which means you cut where you do it more than once, but we only count it once. So if you file one patent in three places or five places, that patent counts as one. That must be hard to do because oftentimes you have different languages. Yes, all. yes. Have yes, that's true, that's true. But often they're actually linked in this European patent base. They're linked to a same, the same code. The way we actually, we did a lot of data cleaning, and one of the ways we actually did this is we had multi-nations, multi 
we had inter students with, with different language skills. We had Chinese students. We had uh, students with different lang Japanese students helping us clean our data. And we actually had, did, had to do a lot of cleaning of the data because of just exactly these kinds of issues. So, so we used a, a team of about 17 undergraduate students who helped us clean the data with different language skills. So, so then we also um, used you know, a variety of different techniques to, to really kind of understand and to sample you know, for missing data and to pick up data and go back to the original patents where we needed to. We had this multilingual research team. And then we also wanted to understand um, in, in this patent data set, many of the patents, the patents for China did not distinguish between what was done in mainland China and what was done in Taiwan. And we actually felt that that was an important distinction. So we actually had some of our students go back and code the data for when it was actually done by the addresses. Here's the research. It's done in, in Taiwan or mainland China. Can anybody imagine why we might have wanted to find out the difference? You guys have any ideas about why we, we would want to make a distinction? Where are you from? from You're from Taiwan. How about you? From mainland. mainland. OK. <laughs> Perfect. Perfect. So why do you think we might want to know the difference between if it was filed in, in mainland China or Taiwan? Do you have any ideas why we might want to know that? No, you have an idea? Anybody have an idea? Why would that be relevant or interesting to know? Well, one of the things that people are really interested in knowing today, we know that there's been a lot of really good work in LEDs going on in Taiwan. We really do know that. It's been historically because there's a lot of work this is a kind of an interesting story. Way, the way the work started in Taiwan is that we had some pretty good, darn good researchers who studied in the United States and worked in the United States. One of them, Dr. Liu in, in, in RCA, uh, in, um, in GE, went back to Taiwan and actually helped the government at, actually put in money to actually help start the manufacturing side of that, of, of that business in packaging. But so there's been a longer history in Taiwan of really development in LEDs, and they've done very well. I mean, you'll see, see with the data that many, many people have done very well. The, the work has been really much more recent in mainland China, but we want to understand what is the work that's now upcoming in Ch mainland China to see how big that growth really is relative to what's going on in, 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 in Taiwan. So we actually went back and, and tried to understand that. One of the things that actually is happening that is that many of the uh, Taiwanese manufacturers who did so well in Taiwan are now locating production in mainland China and changing the name of the game you know, pretty much there, too. So that's one of the things that we tried to do. So we had to do a lot of data cleaning to just even make any sense out of this. And this is the type of IPC code, this international uh, uh, product code, that we used to actually find you know, the data. So, so this is a code, this code up, code here is a code that really relates to basic semiconductor devices for light, em light emission things. So we used a lot of these IPC codes to really reflect, uh, to, to, to go beyond what we could, what would be available in these keyword searches to really see, to really get a good feel for what was really going on in the space. So we used those IPC codes, a perfect example. And then, as I said, we used a whole bunch of keyword searches, and we had to do a lot of data cleaning once we actually d did this. And here's a perfect example. So if you do a keyword search and you put LED in there, what do you think is going to happen? What's the problem with just work using a word like LED? Yes, if you get a word that says, uh, um, something led to something, then you've got to sort all those out, get rid of all those cases that really don't go. So there's a lot of data cleaning to do these things. So, but here's the kinds of keywords that we actually use to actually get to this data set. So finally, and we need to use some keywords searches in, in foreign languages. Yes? Yeah. Yeah, what we tried to do is find enough of the keywords that would fall into these, these, these categories to be able to include that. But, um, and, and we use the IPC codes to really help us with that. And if you look at the, uh, man, you know, there's these manuals that are on the web, you'll find 
IPC codes and exactly what's covered in those things. And they're very, very detailed. So they get down to, you start out with a code that's, you know, five or six uh, numbers long, and you get to a much longer thing that gets to very, very detailed things like this used in that application for infrared for various other kinds of things. But we, you know, collapse those together to just make sure that we actually have a data set that makes some sense in, in this area. Yes. We used, yes, we try to use for all this, not, not just for lighting. Now, one of the other things that the national, that uh, DOE actually asked us to do is something that's almost impossible to do when we tried it, is to try to figure out what are the LEDs that are really related to lighting and what is not related to lighting. And if I asked uh, uh, you to tell, uh, Dr. Nakamura, to tell us, it, that's a really hard thing to do because many of the basic semiconductor stuff that's being, you know, developed can be used in many, many applications, not just for lighting. So the work that you're doing it can be applied to displays, it could be applied to who knows what, and it's very difficult to sort out narrowly what really fits in this lighting category because so many of the fundamental uh, advances are in fundamental, uh, 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 yeah, technologies that really make it difficult to do that. So, okay. So, so then we tried to test our, our results to, you know, to see, well, how well did we do in collect, getting all these data? So we took a couple of more narrowly based uh, companies that we knew that mostly focused on, on, uh, on true LED work, Color Kinetics, uh, Cree, and Nietzsche. But I, can, I don't know, we could ask you whether that's a good one to use or not. And, but what we did was we tried to find out, well, how well did we do in capturing what these companies, if we look at the patents within these, by, by, by just pulling the patents from the companies themselves, how well did we do in our collection technique? And we got about half of what, what we think might have been in these, very nar in these narrower companies, how well did we do in collecting the data? Maybe about half. We probably collected about half of what was really relevant in those fields. So, so let me just show you a little bit of the results. Uh, okay, so here's the kind of application areas. We, take, made a, we made a a stab at trying to figure out, well, which are the application areas. Lighting became very difficult to really sort out by itself. Organic LEDs, L OLEDs, it was a little bit easier because they're more discrete categories, so you can capture that a little bit better. But a lot of stuff, uh, you know, for displays, etc., some are a little bit easier to capture. But here's some of the, here's some of the data. So here's, um, this is applications over time uh, in all, from all of the patent authorities um, uh, for, for our data set. So, so you see here that in the, on the application side, this is Japan, it's really a, a large number of applications. I mean, much, much higher than anybody else um, uh, over time. And the US here is second. Uh, the Republic of Korea, a little bit further down the line. China, uh, in this case, I think we included both our Taiwanese and our mainland China data. So if we break this down a little bit more by time period and by company, you can see here are the leading companies. This is a, um, a set of data for, uh, for the years 1999 through 2003. And over here is 2004 to 2008. So anybody, can you, can you see those well enough from the back? Anybody got any insights in that? Look at, look at the list of the companies. Let me just name, name a few of them. So in this period, 1999 to 2003, Seiko, Mashusta, uh, Sony, Sharp, LG, um, Sanyo, Samsung, et cetera. And keep going down. Look at the list all the way down here. And then what happens here in 2004? Who ends up up, up top here? Can you read that? It's Samsung. So Samsung, it turns out, as we, as we look at our data, Samsung really ends up emerging, both Samsung and LG, really end up in this very recent period of jumping up, you know, way ahead of a lot of the other, of, of a lot of the other companies uh, in, in, the, in, the, in this respect. But overwhelmingly, you look at these, this list, and what do you see in terms of nationality for the companies? Where are they from? Hmm? 
Yeah, well, Asia, but really a lot, mostly from Japan, at least initially. And we've got Phillips in here. And Phillips is over here doing a little bit better in this second period. Who else? We've got Siemens, a German company. We've got Nichio over here, here, another Japanese company. We've got, uh, uh, so we go, go down and, and really, oh, here's Kodak. <laughs> uh, Daewoo's here for, from uh, Korea. And uh, so here, so you, know, you really can see that there's just, in terms of applications, there's just an overwhelming strength you know, certainly from Japan and increasingly from, uh, from, from, from Korea. Now, the other thing we tried to do is look at this idea of, um, you know, the problem with just looking at applications, I, I, as I said, let me, let me explain this if I can. Co uh, people, com companies have a tendency to file first in their own country, and then they, sometimes they'll file elsewhere. Uh, so, but they don't file all the patents elsewhere. And, and actually, maybe I can ask you two of you who have had some real patent experience, and maybe Dr. Nakamura in terms of Nietzsche, uh, w under what circumstances did Nietzsche file patents only in Japan or did they file it, you know, internationally? Do you have a, have a sense of, of which ones they filed only in Japan? Oh, let's say on the important part. Yes. So domestic, uh, we collect uh, about 10 patents. Yes. To one patent. Yes. And uh, this one patent will go to international patents. Yes. Now, how did they decide? How did you decide which one was the one patent that should be filed in more than one nation? Do you have any idea how that was decided? Oh, myself. <laughs> <laughs> you, you decided the one that you thought was the most, the most important? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Like yeah, yeah. So, so it's interesting because it costs a lot to file in more than one nation. So the reason why we wanted to look at patents that were, only, were filed in more than one nation is it, we assumed that if a company decides to spend more money to file in more than one, one, more than that one nation, they thought that was an important patent that might be commercially important. So in order to really check our results for everywhere in the world, we wanted to make sure that it, it, was, it was the most valuable patents also that we were looking at. So we look, that's this multi-nation patent thing. So let's look at what we see here. So now, in terms of multi-nation patents, Philips is doing a lot better. They're, they're at the top here. Samsung's still high here. Again, we've got our great Japanese players. Kodak's not too bad. Uh, and then we come down here um, and see a lot of other people. Here we go now in this later period. Who's up there again, even in the multi-nation patents? Samsung really has jumped up there. Philips still is OK, but boy, Samsung's really over there in terms of application. Siemens, again, looks like it's doing a little bit better under that measure. Kodak, again, is not too bad. But you know, in here, here's some of the Taiwanese companies uh, coming into play here. Um, uh, 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 so you know, in here we go Cree um, down here in Agilent and Agilent and 3M, finally. So this is. Yes. How do you measure outlying uh, patents' uh, impact? I mean, for instance, Nichia's I know. Uh, patents at Nichia. I know. know. Obviously, you know, Nichia is very far right, down right, these, these right. lists, but they've had a huge impact. It has impact. had a huge impact. Um, I do not know how to do that. And if anybody has an idea of how to do that. Well, what you'd have to do, I think, is trace back from the technology, what the linkages are to specific Yeah. Patents. Now, one thing people do is they look at which patents are most highly cited. That's one way okay. people do that. So that is a kind of analysis that one could do that. But to really trace the commercial value of that, it's very, very difficult from this kind of data. I don't, I'm not sure that you really can do it. And that's where the idea of looking at products and what are the things that companies actually produce from that or market share or what do they actually achieve from that is so important. So just looking at the patent data alone probably doesn't tell you, is not going to tell you that. So I think we have to do, you know, a lot more than that. So we're trying to understand. So, so, but we're not really trying to get so much at the individual commercial value of this with this kind of things. But we'd at least like to understand what countries and which companies are spent, you know, are making a real effort in this area are really expending some resources and spending some, it's a, probably a, a decent measure, a measure of that, um, even though it's certainly not perfect and it's not going to tell you 
you know, who's got the most commercially valuable patents. So, so then, if you sort of add it all up, what you realize is these are the multi-nation applications by the nations of invention. So, so you know, all we, had, we, we were looking in the last two charts about all the companies. But if you add them all together from the headquarters of where those, where those companies are located, this is kind of what it looks like. So again, for Japan, a tremendous an effort in both, the, both periods, in this 99 period and the 2004 period. Korea is really up there. US in this earlier period is a little bit higher. But Korea really emerges really up there in Taiwan. Then again, now once you count all the companies together here, you can see a little bit better that, uh, that what's what's going on. So again, and then way down here, these other countries really are not making much impact. Uh, look at in this later period, mainland China is starting to to, to show up and make a, a bit of an impact. Um, and and Netherlands really that's Philips, uh, Philips uh, the company. So, so then it's not so bad. So that was applications. Those are applications that are filed. This is actually the data for granted patents. And I don't know if you remember that first chart way back when I showed you Japan, way up there in terms of applications. But in terms of granted patents, it's actually not as bad as that earlier chart because we have the United States much closer in terms of tracking the, the granted patents, the actual patents that were granted. So sometimes people can apply for patents, but they're not necessarily granted. And then, again, the leading companies. Uh, again, you see Samsung really jumping up here. Sharp is, is the second in line here. Philips is, is about the fourth. Siemens is a little bit further down here. And again, if we look at that last two periods, we can see, um, again, the strength of the uh, Japanese firms. Uh, and again, Samsung and LG really coming in fairly strongly in this latter period. And this Taiwanese company, uh, oh, electronics, you know, coming in there. Kodak is playing some role, mostly, I think, in the OLED space um, uh, in that later period. And then if we look at the cumulative multi-nation patents, again, you know, Philips actually looks pretty strong here. Cumulatively, uh, Seiko and Sharp and Siemens and Toshiba and Sony and all the, all the characters that you sort of expect to see uh, again, and this is for that earlier period, but let me look at the most recent period. So again, Samsung's right up there, uh, Seiko and Philips and Siemens and Sanyo, et cetera. So just to give you, give you a feel for that. Okay, so um, again, going into the granted patents for all the nations, we can see here that uh, the U.S was second in this earlier period, in the 2004 period, really the Koreans are starting to come up. And it's really, it's, uh, it's really Samsung and LG who are very strong in that. And, and this is really Philips. The Netherlands is really, really Philips. OK, so then I'm not going to bore you much more with these slides, but you can break this out by display technologies. And again, Philips, uh, again, uh, Samsung is very, very strong in the recent period. Uh, lighting, we tried to break it out into a much more narrow category of lighting. And you start to see some of the big, big three or four lighting companies, uh, Philips, Siemens, Mashusta, and GE, again, in the more narrow lighting domain. And they're doing well in, in both periods. Uh, but what's really part of the news in this part of it is that, as I mentioned earlier on, Companies that had never really pay, played in the lighting space are really starting to play in the lighting space, like Toshiba and other companies that were really strong in consumer products and consumer electronics products. So this is just a quick idea of the other kinds of things that you can do, which is to take a look at, well, where do people actually produce things? So that was where, where people are patenting. And here's a chart uh, from our, our friends from uh, Canaccord Adams, who were at our local conference, uh, with our uh, conference that Dan organized this week. And this is really uh, the uh, location of the production of uh, gallium nitrate LEDs. Uh, and this is actually by capacity. So you can see that Taiwan, as I mentioned before, is really pretty big in this, 38%. Japan, 25%. Europe, only 17%. Mainland China. Uh, is 3% in the U.S., about 12% in Korea, about 14%. So it's, you know, there's a lot of intellectual property, and then you get to this question of 
well, where do people actually locate production and what kinds of production is being located in which parts of the world? So I just want to make a couple of observations about this, and then I'm going to show you a quick slide that changes the pace a little bit, but talks about the kind of evolution of industries over time. And the observations about this is there's really a much greater role of international companies than seen by looking at US data alone. And obviously, Samsung is sort of zooming ahead at the top of these patent rankings is, and really is very prominent in, in both displays and OLEDs. I didn't show you all the data, but there they are. Uh, solid state act, uh, lighting, act, solid state activity is really grow, growing in, uh, growing role of Asia in this solid state space. And Taiwan, of course, and also mainland China. And in, in the data for mainland China, what we actually found was there were many, many individuals patenting in Ch mainland China. Not so much companies, but a lot of individual patents coming out from, from people. I don't know what the quality of the patents is or anything else, but a lot of patenting being done by individuals and not really large companies. Um, a lot of the locus of manufacturing for, uh, for LEDs is really moving to China, mainland China. And the traditional lighting firms uh, are transitioning, obviously, into solid state lighting. And they're doing it by partly through joint ventures and acquisitions. And so we have Philips you know, acquiring several companies, including color kinetics control companies and co companies to really make them vertically integrated up the value chain. Um, and I think we're going to start to see some major competition from strong consumer electronics firms. And, and the question then becomes, what really is the role, or what role can smaller firms really play in this whole new lighting, in this whole new space? What are, kind, what are the kinds of opportunities are there for not necessarily just the big players, but are there really an opportunity, are there really opportunities for smaller players? Yeah, I'm Dan. curious whether you, um, you, know, you made a big point about you didn't look uh, beyond the US right. And I wonder whether you did any kind of comparison or mapping between uh, to see whether just looking at the US is at least semi-quantitatively consistent with the broader view. I would guess that it would be for the following reason. And it goes back to your question about how you decide whether to file internationally. Right. As should be suggested, you do that for the kind of core enabling things. That right think really are, are really valuable are, are valuable in the, in the critical path of products and so forth but there's a separate question which is which countries do you go into right right you know there's yeah. over a hundred countries right, right. and of course that's yeah, very yeah. expensive and so yeah, forth right, and that's the way right. we always decided that you know we never went to more than a dozen right you know you, well you go in the European Union broadly right. but you go where yeah, you go to the where U.S. The where the markets are, where right? Markets right, right. That's right. And the U.S. is is know, one of the main markets. Of, it is. It is. Markets. But so why isn't that a good proxy for your it, well, we did actually do that, and and I did I didn't put that on the slides because we have these tables that actually show uh, by 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 firm which which firms apply for what patents in which countries. So the interesting thing is. It, there's a real difference in, in how which firms apply where. Obviously, a lot of Japanese firms that want uh, multinational patents will apply, at least in the United States, and very often someplace in Europe. Uh, it turns out that some of the U.S. firms, like GE, they mostly filed in the United States. They did very little filing anywhere else, um, uh, and then now increasingly people might file in China. Well, so. Well, that's an interesting question. Uh, I mean, I, I think probably GE th thinks that what they're doing is pretty valuable. What's curious about it is why they haven't applied, you know, more generally. Well, no, no, but, but, but I'm saying, I mean, everybody, if you're going to file a patent, you think it's, it has some value. Otherwise yes, you yes, do yeah, that. yeah. But in your test is if you're going to file internationally, then that really is indicative. Yeah, it's more, more indicative value. that you think it has more value. Right. But what we have found is absolutely that if we only look at the U.S. patents, it actually does distort the results because not everybody files, you know, we think that we're the most important market. We're a very important market, absolutely. But you underestimate really the amount of work by only looking at the U.S. patents. It's really a little bit better if you look at these multi-nation patent filings rather than whether it's just in the U.S. or, or someplace else. Okay, so you might, yes, go ahead. So that implies that there are a lot of patents 
that people feel are so important that they're going to file multinational. Yeah, they're going to file in more than two countries. And, and they're not going to file in the U.S. Well, uh, they're not all filed in just the U.S. No, they're absolutely not. not. Just the US. Yeah. What I'm saying is that if you only look at the U.S. patent, it's a more objective measure to look at patents that are filed in more than one country than it is to say we, the, that everybody who doesn't file in the U.S. doesn't have anything of value. That's what we, we, we that's why we did this research in the first place. And, and yes, the U.S. is a very important market, so a lot of things do get filed in the United States, absolutely, but it's not nearly anything like 100%. And because the countries, the, because the companies have a tendency to file first in their own markets, they absolutely do, then you really do miss and underestimate the real, real strength of, 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 of the firms. So that's why we did this study in the first place, because we, we knew, and the Department of Energy thought so also, that only by, by restricting yourself to one nation that you really do distort the picture of who's, who's doing what. But you're absolutely right that we don't have Nobody has great ways of, of really understanding the value of, 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 of certain kinds of patents. And really, you don't know that for some period of time. So it's better in to, to address that question. You're better off really doing a historical study. Go back and look at key fundamental patents. And the only way you can do that is by looking at citations. So let's imagine that I've got uh, Dr. Nakamura's most recent patent. I wouldn't be able to tell whether that was a great patent until about five or ten years from now. So I might be able to tell for his original work, but I might not be able to tell you know, for, for a few years. So that kind of work is something that yeah, absolutely does need to be done. But what we're really trying to understand here is who's really spending the time and the effort and the work? And then what, how is that going to be trans is it translating into actual product that people are producing and, and market share and, and something that really is, is valuable? So where are the opportunities for the small firms? Now I'll show you another example here. We did some studies, historical studies, of uh, the challenges of this idea of challenges of competing in emerging markets. And what we looked at was the um, uh, LCD, uh, very famous you know, sort of examples of how uh, the, some of the pioneering work in LCD research actually did take place in, in the United States, but, uh, but really most of the American firms kind of dropped out of the industry over time partly because they really failed to invest in scaling up during some critical technology development phases beginning you know, at the beginning of the LCDs. And the question we were really asking, we wanted to look very carefully at the history of what happened here so that we wanted to understand is are there any similar patents, patterns that might be emerging in, uh, in it, what might be occurring in some of the emerging, other emerging industries, and what can really be done to sort of ensure that we don't make the same mistakes. So the question here is, you know, do stayers develop a competitive advantage? And let me just show you this data, because it is kind of astounding. This is the fraction of firms surviving in the LCD industry over time, starting in the 70s and you know, going to the present period. And most of you know that LCD panels were really used originally in uh, watches, digital watches, and uh, calculators. And there's just a whole variety of products. The big one, big application being, OK. Big application being um, uh, computers, especially you know, we get into laptop computers and just all of these applications over time. Here, here are the Japanese firms and here are the US firms. So the Japanese firms, these are the survival rates. So all those Japanese firms that went into the industry really early on stayed in the industry through all of these successive set of product activities. So here's the US firms, the US firms who some of them were really pioneers in this industry. Active matrix displays were pioneered by, by uh, Brody at, at Westinghouse. So here they are, big firms, little firms, all dropping out of the industry over time here. Uh, and, and, and really, we don't have any American firms really in, in this industry for practically at all. So you, know, you have to ask yourself the question, and we've got much more you know, real, real paper on this and, and trying to explain what happened and, why various people left. And so we had the exit of the large firms for a lot of different reasons, the exit of the startups, even with the military funding, DARPA funding that tried to restart the industry and get American players in. They ma ma basically were making a uh, product of pa uh, flat panels for military use and you know, all dropping out. So you have to say, OK, what happened? <laughs> 
you know, why do we have so many players that drop out of these industries that are billion dollar industries as they emerge over time? Why, why are there so few successful firms, even though they're pioneers in some of the technology development? It's a real, it's a real question. Uh, I'm yes. Sorry. Yeah, they, that's they, their they perception. Their yeah, no, market. yeah, but that's that's what they think. But what happens is that it, it's exactly you know the opposite. What happens is they think the mar market's going to be small, and so then they don't make the key investments to stay in the industry. A perfect example of that is our friend Barry, who worked at AT and T, uh, and they you know did a they asked McKinsey to do a study of of what's the size of the mobile device market. McKinsey did a study and said there are 250,000 people will buy mobile devices. So the, the key people at AT&T said, okay, let's, it's too small a market, we don't we need to be in here. They dropped out of the market. Very similar kinds of situations here. So you think, the problem is that you, under, you underestimate the size of the market. The market, the large market, well, well, two things. The Japanese actually were more successful in getting into the mass ma market applications in, in, in LCDs by calculators and watches. That was one of the first things. Then the second thing is when the really big market emerges with computers, there, there aren't any, there are very few strong American players, and the players that are left were too small and, did, and were all venture capital based firms that really didn't have the manufacturing prowess to really compete. So you've got this combination of believing that the market may be too small, not being willing to do what it takes to make the manufacturing investment, bringing the yields up and the price down so that you actually can compete in this industry effectively. And that's how a lot of these companies actually dropped out. DARPA comes in and, and wants to re-stimulate the market because they don't want to be stuck without any flat panel capability. But again, it's small firms making one-off products or a few off products for a military market. And that's not the same thing as having the manufacturing capability to really succeed. You so might, that's the you story. You misheard me. I didn't say market, I, besides markets, I said margin. Well, and, yes, and, the margins. And, and companies, companies, you know, follow. Yeah, they often. think they're following that. What happens that. is if something gets commoditized, margins get squashed, yeah, yeah. and companies move out. Of well, they do, and market. they do. But the problem is that, you know, they do that. And it turns out then, you know, so they said that over here. Turns out this big market emerges. And then the flat panel TV market emerges. And then another market emerges that really make a lot of money. These companies who stayed in this industry made billions and billions of dollars. No, no, but, you know, we say that all the time. And that's one of the fallacies in the United States. We can't make it. We don't make enough money. Let's move on to the next thing. And what happens is that those guys are the one who, ones who benefit. Then they're the ones who actually do the next generation of engineering technology, the next generation of R&D, and, and we're nowhere to be seen. It, it's really a fallacy in the, in the US thinking about that. I, I absolutely believe that. And I, it, it really is based on not being willing to make the manufacturing investments that it takes to really do this stuff right. And the challenge is, that you know who's going to make the money here, and you know the the, the um, Koreans actually now have put a lot of pressure on the Japanese companies by moving into this and doing a great job with the LED backlit TVs, three 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 D TVs, OLED TVs. Um, uh, they're top in memory chips and L LCD, second largest. Um, handset vendors. Now I don't want to be all do gloom and doom, so let me show you this one. But you can't, we can do something. Here's Apple. What did Apple do? With great innovative products and, and, and some of you know, great software design and great interface design, Apple really has become, in terms of value, the third largest uh, smartphone player in the world. So, so what they've been able to do is find this combination of great design, great interface with the media, and really make a difference. We need more companies like Apple who can really do this in other spaces. And I'll just finish off by talking a little bit about what my opportunities there may be in the lighting space. So, so here we got all these 
uh, niche market, these markets that are emerging in the, in the lighting space. And so what are the real opportunities for sort of American firms? Well, here we've got all the traditional lighting firms. Well, certainly we're going to play a role someplace here. We've got these new lighting firms that are likely to play a big role in this growing, emerging market. So what's, what can US companies do? Well, one of the things we're saying is the real role that we can actually play is, is really rethinking you know, the, the smart lighting part of this thing, the whole real control part of this thing, and the part of this, this activity and, and lighting that really makes it possible to do controllable, tunable color lights to be much more energy efficient and cost effective, to really link this into health and therapeutic and circadian rhythms and adaptive health things, and to do, again, smart grid and smart buildings. So there's still a lot of real openings here, despite the fact that that you know, we haven't necessarily, uh, we don't necessarily control all the you know fundamental IP in, in some of the, the at the, some of the, the products and device sides, and so I'll, I'll finish by just saying, you know, what's the role of both you know firms and the government in trying to stimulate and make sure that we really do have a role to play? Uh, um, uh, you know, what what are we really investing enough, not only just in the basic research, but in in the key. Um, uh, manufacturing and the key uh, processes that will allow us to actually to generate those clean energy jobs that we're always talking about trying to generate, uh, not just in the research lab, but really beyond. And I will finish on that. Yes, yes, we have. Um, but, you know, we should be higher, but, you know, if, if we, we only, you know, calculate that. Um, what we're certainly going to see is that there are four or five countries in the world that just play, play a big role just because of the volume issue. That's absolutely true. So, you know, the, Nether, uh, the Netherlands, because of Philips, you know, plays a role. But, you know, France and, you know, way down the list, there's partly a question of whether they're working in the area, but it's also that the, the volume of patents is absolutely lower. Yeah, that's a good point. That's a good point. Anybody else? Yes. Uh, when you're looking at the patent data like found in uh, multiple countries, uh, I mean, one of the things that factors in is expensive to do. So big companies, Samsung, for instance, they yeah. have a lot of money to you're right. it. Yeah. That's something that can skew the analysis. In yeah, of, like, that's a good point. Like yeah. Well, what, what it does is we know that they're rich and they've got a lot of money and they can file more patents. So it gets back to the value of the patents, doesn't it? And this question of whether the, we need to really understand whether the value of the patents versus the quantity of the patents. And I think that's where some of the backward citation data, we really have to do much more analysis on, on that. But you know, the other point that you make here is those countries are, those companies are rich. Not only can they file patents, but they can also invest in manufacturing and they can invest in the tech capabilities to actually bring the thing to market. So surprisingly, we've got a lot of the Chinese independent researchers who come up with a lot of patents. They don't tend to file in the multi-nation space because it's too expensive, but there's just a tremendous number of independent patents coming out of China. Yes? Yeah. Yeah. No. Are they just I don't know. No, I don't. I don't think they're really thinking about companies licensing. I think what's happening in mainland China, and you can probably tell us better. Um, there's lots of different little companies starting to make product, and they're making tons of product and tons of stuff. And everybody's an entrepreneur, and everybody wants to get out there and do something. Now, the, while the value, while the quality of some of the work that's coming out there is is not great, not perfect at this point. They are definitely going up the learning curve and will get better and better over time. And the manufacturing, the location, the locus of the manufacturing, a lot of manufacturing is now, of, of various parts of the value chain is now being located in mainland China. So the Taiwanese companies that perfected processes in Taiwan are now moving those to mainland China. That will help you know, generate more and more you know, capability, if you will, and they'll go up the learning curve. But these independent, we don't, we don't know exactly know what happens with these independent patents. I don't know if you have any insight into that at all. Maybe not. <laughs> yeah. I'm not directly in this Yeah, 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 yeah.
Right. Right. Yeah. Right. 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 Yeah. So there's going to be some stuff that really is interesting coming out of that. Yes. So we have legal system. Yes. So U.S. legal system is a very in the world, especially in the increasing process because the penalties or fines are huge money, you know. Yes. But in Asian countries, this guy, you know. There are no penalty almost there. Even if the company increases the pattern, yes. fine or penalty, because the penalty is almost nothing there. Yeah. In Japan, all over Asian countries. Yeah. Europe, I don't know, it's so much better. The government is better than China. Yeah, Europe is better than Asian countries. But the best place in the United States, because the fine penalty is huge money. Yeah, so yeah. everybody wants to sign the pattern in the United States. So, yes, yeah, <laughs> sign, yeah, play to play there too, exactly. Right, yeah. right. Whitney, did you have a point? I just wanted to ask if there were any other non-profit you know, higher number of small companies and individuals in China, were there any other were there any individuals that were small or any other? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Uh, you know, we have so much that we actually did a about an 85% page report for the DOE and we found a lot of interesting little things and detailed stuff. But I, the one thing that really struck us is the number of individuals who were patenting separately without co so there seemed to be company relationships in the China thing. Well, I, it, was, it was a lot more. I don't remember the numbers exactly now. It just seemed like there was a lot more like these independent, like, like the independent researchers who were really not filing as part of a larger company that we, at least that we could see. I mean, it's a little hard to tell that again. The data is a little bit fuzzy. So I don't want to, yes, right. So we need to pass for deaths by the survival rate. Yes. Have you considered that a lot of times in the U.S., like for HP or GE, when they start doing the lighting business, start dotting the LED business, that part, that segment is spin out. Oh, spin out to somebody else, yeah. No, we did follow. We followed that in the ca in this case. This was not the LED business. This was the LCD business. We did chase. We traced all what happened to different companies and whether they got bought out by somebody else. But that's a very good point. Usually, when people don't want to do what they do in the division, they spin it out. And the other thing that happens is that there are a lot of venture companies. A lot of the companies that were the new venture companies started out because they were very frustrated in their larger companies because the company managers would not support that. So they started new ventures. And they went out and got venture capital. The problem was even the most famous inventors never had got enough venture capital to really be able to do the manufacturing thing right. So eventually they dropped out as well. And they were very frustrated by that because they couldn't get the venture capitalists, once the, some of the Japanese and some of the better players got in and brought the cost down, the venture capitalist says, no, we're not going to give you any more money because you can't compete against these guys. So but that's the problem. But I would suggest that the yeah. bright side of that point is that the U.S. is still the most innovative and entrepreneurial country in the world by far. And so that survival rate chart uh, largely comes from the fact that You've got such a higher rate of startups here trying to innovate. Yes, that's true. The, and the that's companies true. in Japan that you listed right. are, were giant companies right, right, already, so right. they're not going to fail. Right, oh, right, you know, right. That's it, true. It, it, but that's true. But, but where you, then what you have to ask yourself is who makes the money and who creates the jobs in these industries? And the downside is that if you care about ultimately who makes the money, and, and it does matter because it goes into the next generation of, of R&D. If you don't make any money on the products, you don't have any money to spend. And then who, who, where are the jobs? Where are the jobs? That's the big question. And it can't just be in the research lab. We want a lot of researchers, but we want to translate that into actual employment in, on the factory floor, and that's one of the problems we've got. Taiwan, the Taiwanese are now worried about that because 6% unemployment rate, which was really low before. You know, this first generation of people in semiconductors in Taiwan worked really hard. And people are worried about the next generation here. I don't, I, the, the no blue, gloom and doom is, so what are we going to do to really compete? And I, there are some places where we really can compete, but we've got to really think carefully and, and long and well about it. And hopefully we can create 
more of Apple's type, type of, of, of companies that can be really successful in some product categories, uh, you know, where, with following that model. All right, I'll let yeah, everybody go question. home. <laughs> yes. <One last. coughs> Oh, oh, oh. Uh, there are lots of, um, you know, that's one thing that we have to analyze a little bit more is that one of the things we're very interested in, in, uh, in, in studying is who are the key researchers who are making fundamental contributions. Now, most of the, some of them are, gonna, uh, are now in research institutions and not in companies. But when you stack up all the numbers, uh, that, the reason why the companies turn out to be so high is because they've got larger numbers of patents. It's absolutely true. But one of the things we want to do is we want to trace key researchers. We'll start with, with, uh, with Dr. Nakamura and look at how many patents he's actually developed over time. And, you know, follow researchers in terms of, you know, where they've worked and how, how they've really done that. That's something that we actually do plan to do. Yeah. Definitely research institutes are very important in this whole space, too. Yeah. Well, okay. Thank well, thank you. Thank you. Thanks.